Welcome back everybody. Today we're going to be taking a deeper look at ePoll. Now if you weren't aware, ePoll is a mechanism in the Linux kernel by which you can wait on multiple file descriptors to be ready for input and output with one single call and then just handle them dynamically as they come in. I showed off in my previous video how powerful they are, but today I kind of want to put it under the microscope a little bit and I've got this very simple program here to do that. So hopefully you can learn the ins and outs of ePoll, no pun intended, and uh, you apply it better in your own programs. So there's two components to ePoll that we're going to talk about today. And the first is uh, ePoll for input events, which I'm, I've got this little demo program here. And the second is output events, which I've got this demo program here, which is essentially the same thing, but it has some extra stuff that we'll get to when we get to it. Essentially, with ePoll, there's a couple things you need to define right off the bat. So the first is a file descriptor for your ePoll instance. So down here, you can see I do a command called ePoll create one, and I assign the return value to this ePoll file descriptor here. So essentially, that's your control file descriptor. Uh, that's whenever you want to interact with the ePoll instance you register, we're going to be using this particular file descriptor right here. The second thing that I'm going to uh, define is events ready. Now, when we actually read from our ePoll file descriptor, what, what happens is essentially all of the file descriptors that we register with ePoll to watch, any number of them could generate any number of events. So what we have to do when we actually get data from ePoll is loop through all of those events and handle them directly. So when we do our ePoll wait call, it'll return the number of events that we have to handle afterwards. So a couple other things. Uh, the way I'm going to be demonstrating input and output today is with pipes. I will do a follow-up video on pipes, but essentially all you have to know is that pipes are a pair of input and output file descriptors, one of which you can write to and the other which you can read to. So I define an array of pipes here essentially and I've got four of them for the moment. Now the next component to ePoll are these two struct uh, arrays here. So whenever you go ahead and register something to ePoll, what you have to do is sort of set up how you want ePoll to watch that file. There are a couple different options you can use to set that file. So essentially for every file descriptor we want to put onto our ePoll instance, we also have to have an ePoll event struct representing the settings that we're going to give to ePoll. I'll go over those in just a minute. So, but for the moment, I've got the same number of my max input pipes because for every pipe that I want put on ePoll, I have to tell ePoll, hey, these are the settings that I want you to use. I also have this ePoll event queue. Now, if you remember what I said before about events ready right here, essentially what happens is ePoll puts all of the events that it gets into this event queue. And so when we actually loop through and handle it, what we're actually looping through is this events queue array right here. So that'll contain things like the file descriptor involved, the settings involved, the kind of event it is, things like that. So if you want to write your own programs with ePoll, the two headers that you want to include are sys ePoll header .h and fcntl. Now this one here provides the ePoll actual library functions. So ePoll create one, ePoll wait, etc. Um, and this one up here just provides some flag definitions that are relevant to ePoll. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up the man page real quick because you can see the first thing we do is this ePoll create one call. And I'm going to go over that and explain sort of what it means. So here on the ePoll manual page, we can scroll down and we can see there are actually two different ePoll create functions. So they create a new ePoll instance and return a file descriptor referring to that instance. Now there are two of these. So if we go ahead and look at this page right here, it'll tell us what the difference is. So as you can see, this first one here has a size argument. And the second one, ePoll create one has a flags argument. Now it says here that since Linux 2.6.8, size is ignored. So why I think they created this one right here is because they wanna keep the old one for backwards compatibility, even though size doesn't do anything. But to extend the functionality, they've just changed it to a flags argument in ePoll create one. So the actual flag you can set here for ePoll create one is close on exec, um, which is the same as close exec on the standard open, uh, the standard open system call. So the next thing we go ahead and do uh, after that, and if you have a look at the return value, you can see here on success, it's a file descriptor on error, it's negative one. So we go ahead and just check the value here. 
So we create our epoll instance, and this is the thing that we're actually going to use whenever we want to manipulate the epoll instance we've created. So let's say we want to add a file descriptor to epoll to be watched. We're going to reference epoll file descriptor here. We want to remove something, same deal, right? So essentially that's, that's our reference to our instance. Now, the next thing that I go ahead and do here is loop through and create all the pipes that I'm going to use to demo this stuff. This is not related to epoll in general. I'm just using pipes to demo epoll's functionality. So all I do is I create pipes for everything in this array here. Like you can see, it's a 2D array. Um, and then I'm going to print out all of the file descriptors that I open and what index they are. Now, this is where the epoll stuff comes in. So if you remember, I was talking about before, we actually have to set up this, uh, like these settings basically for each epoll event. And so I'm going to set two things. I've got this dot events and dot data dot FD. So if we bring the man page back up and this time I'm going to look at this epoll event struct and we're going to have a, we're going to have a look at this. So you can see here, it's got two, uh, members. It's got an events, which is a uint32 and it's got a epoll data struct. So this events is essentially what kind of events do you want epoll to look for? And this epoll data is metadata in this case about the uh, file descriptor that we're gonna use. So we, you wanna set this file descriptor right here to the file descriptor you wanna monitor. So as I mentioned just before, right here is where I actually set that file descriptor. So as you can see up above, I had this EINF array essentially right here of all of the file descriptors that corresponded to all of these pipes that I created here. So all I'm doing in this loop is I'm saying the corresponding epoll event right here, so EINFI, the dot data dot FD is going to be set to the read end of the pipe that I created here that corresponds to it. Now, again, I'm just doing the pipes as a demo. You can use epoll for anything really, like anything that you can block on for input output. So think uh, network sockets, Unix sockets, things like that. And again, in my previous video, I showed how to do it for a socket server. Now you might notice here, I have this uh, dot events, and this is a uint32, set to epoll in. So what does that actually mean? Well, if I go ahead and pull back up the man pages here, I'm gonna have a look at epoll CTL, which is the thing that we actually use to add things to our epoll e event watcher. And if we scroll down a little bit, you can see here it describes the events men, uh, member of the struct. So it's a bit mask, right? And you all together a bunch of these different ones. And so epoll in, uh, the associated file is available for read operations. Epoll out is associated for, is available for write operations. So if you think about it, you'll set this depending on what you actually want to do. So if you're wanting to block until one of your file descriptors is available to be read, then you would use epoll in. If you want to block until it's available to be written, then you'd use epoll out. And I'll, I'll demo epoll out in just a bit. There are a couple other ones here. Um, but the one that I really want to focus on is epoll et, which is for edge triggered. And I'll go over edge triggered in just a bit. But if we go back over to our code here, you can see we're setting epoll in only for the moment. So essentially what we're wanting to do is for every file descriptor in this array, uh, we're going to block until one of them or multiple of them are available for reading. So here you can see we uh, do the epoll CTL call. Now, if we go back here and we'll actually look at the arguments of the epoll CTL call, uh, you can see we need the epoll FD, which is our epoll file descriptor. You need the operation, uh, which is epoll CTL add, mod, or delete. So we're using add because we're just adding it onto the thing. You can use mod if you want to change things associated with it. Um, and the glorious thing about this, about the whole epoll interface, is that when you actually go and call epoll wait uh, down here, you can actually still be waiting on this and be adding and removing things from the epoll instance, and this can still be waiting. So if you've got another thread that's adding or removing or modifying things from the epoll instance, you don't have to re-wait. You don't have to exit this wait and then re-wait. It's just all handled for you dynamically, which is really, really cool. So back here, uh, you can see the two ones we're mainly interested in are epoll add and delete. And so that's the operation here. Now, the third one is the file descriptor that you want to be adding. And of course, in my call to epoll add down here, I'm using the read end of that pipe, which again is the same thing I set as .data.fd. And then the final thing is uh, the pointer to the epoll event struct, which has all your configured settings in it. So 
In this case, we're using the address of EINFI, <laughs> which again, correspond is the, the settings that I've corresponded to these ones. They're the same size. Uh, so you get one-to-one -one correspondence. And of course, this will return a negative one if it's an error. And there are also various other error flags that the whole ePoll stuff sets that you can check if you really care about. Um, but the return value here is negative one for a non for an error and zero for a non-error. Okay, so if that returned a zero, technically we're done setting up ePoll and we can just wait for our events. This next bit of code here is kind of cheeky. So this if statement right here, essentially if I% percent two is zero, so if the index, this is the modulo operator, it's basically uh, you get the remainder of a division operator. So if I% percent two is zero, so essentially if this is an even number, like in our loop, then I'm going to write to the file. So technically I'm writing to every second file descriptor and that's for our demo purposes. So what I wanna show you with this is that down here in our loop, so we're doing a while true and like I just told you before, events ready is going to be the number of events returned by this epoll wait thing here. And we'll cover epoll wait in just a second. But what I wanna show you is that by modifying this statement right here, it'll actually change the file descriptors we get events for down here. And that's gonna be the whole demo. So for now, I'm writing to every second file descriptor here. So now we're gonna take a look at epoll wait. If I bring up the manual page for that, you can see this is the call here. There are a couple other ones, but this is the main one we're gonna focus on today. So this epoll FD right here, of course, is the epoll instance file descriptor that we created earlier. This uh, epoll events array of structs essentially is this one right here. So remember I told you earlier, we need to set up an event queue because any number of the file descriptors we wanna watch could send any number of events. And so we need to have some mechanism for us to loop through that and, and hold them essentially for us to handle them later. So in our epoll wait call, we just give them the event queue and the max epoll events is of course the number of max events. And we wanna make sure that that does not exceed our array's capacity. And this last one here is a timeout. So essentially you can set a timeout if you want to do sort of non-blocking waits. So in this instance, I've set it to negative one because I want to block forever. But if you had this set to say one or something, your program would wait one second for any of these to become available. And if they weren't, it could do something else in the background while it waits for them to become enabled. But today I'm just going to do this forever. Okay, so now on my terminal where I'm going to go ahead and demo this, I'm going to compile it with just this command here. So gcc epoll in dot c dash o epoll in, nothing crazy. And if we go ahead and run it, you'll notice a couple things. So right here, um, I've set up four pipes because that's my max input pipes up here. So, and for each pipe, of course, I set up two file descriptors, a read end and a write end. So this print statement right here just prints the index and then the read uh, file descriptor associated with that and then the write file descriptor associated with that. Now, if you remember what I told you about before, here I'm going to be writing to every second file descriptor. So essentially, if the index percent two is zero, then in that case, you know, we'll, we'll do something with that. So essentially zero, like you can see, we've got a, an event for file descriptor four, because that's my print statement right here. You loop through the events ready and event QI dot events uh, is going to be the, the actual event type that you got. And event qi.data.fd is going to be the file descriptor associated with that event. So as you can see, I got event one, which is actually just uh, the value of this epoll in right here. So as you can see, we're watching for type one events and we print that out, that's one. So we got an epoll in event um, for file descriptor four, which corresponds to zero. Now, if you do this computation right here, 0% two does in fact equal zero. So it'll write to that file descriptor. And as you can see, we got an event on that file descriptor. Now, if you look at this one right here, so the file descriptor for index two, we got eight and nine. And as you can see, we got an event for eight because 2% two is of course zero. Now, if I go ahead up here and change this to say 16, I'll show you what I mean. So we'd recompile it and we do it again. And as you can see, I've got many, many more events um, and they're all for these sort of even index file descriptor numbers. So if I put that back to four, and change this and just to show you there's no smoke and mirrors going on here i change it to divisible by three instead what i expect is i'll still get one for zero but then it'll be three instead so here you can see we did in fact get one for file descriptor four which is index zero 
but we also got one for FD10, which is three right here. So that kind of gives you an introduction, like we're only writing to these ones sort of very specifically, but then epoll wait, it doesn't care, right? It'll just grab uh, whichever ones are ready and our program can handle it dynamically. And that's the real power of epoll because as I showed in my socket server video, you know, any number of clients could send anything at once and we can just go ahead and handle them all in the exact same way and we don't necessarily care what file descriptor it is. And this is really where the scalability of epoll comes in, right? If you think about it in a thread per client model, where you spin up every thread to watch a different file descriptor, that's that doesn't scale very well. But if you've got this where you know one sort of one thread can just watch on as many file descriptors as it wants and just handle whichever ones are ready, that's where you get real scalability and real power. So this is really, really cool stuff. Now, the next thing I wanna cover is edge triggering versus level triggering. So at the moment, this is a level triggered program. And what that means is that epoll will give us an event as long as the level is satisfied. So for example, here we're waiting for a read event, right? So as long as we don't actually do this read call down here, epoll will give us an event. So let me show you what I mean. If I just comment this out right here and I compile and run it again, you can see we get events forever because we never actually read anything from it. Now, if I want this to only happen when an event first is ready for, for reading essentially, like I don't want this constant until I read, what I can actually do here is set the edge triggered flag. So if I change this to epoll in or epoll et, which is the edge trigger, and I recompile this, you can see that even though I don't have this read call right here, I still only get it once. And of course the message is garbage because I haven't read anything yet, but you can sort of see you would choose level triggering, which is, is this event condition satisfied? If yes, then I'll give you an event or edge triggering where the first time this event is satisfied, I'll give you, you know, something to read or something to handle rather. You can see different situations where those would be useful. So I've gone and changed this back to two. And if you have a look at our code now, we should be getting an event for index zero and index two, which we in fact do. Now, if I uncomment this line right here, this is epoll ctl delete. So essentially, um, I don't want to wait for anything from index two anymore. So we're gonna delete that from the queue. So if I go ahead and do that, you can see we don't get an event for index two. So I just wanted to demo deleting a file descriptor and you know, epoll ctl, you do the exact same thing as adding, except with this delete flag right here. And in fact, as I mentioned before, epoll ctl can be called from a completely separate thread while we're waiting right here and epoll is all dynamic it'll handle that for you and after you delete it you won't get any more events for that particular file descriptor which is pretty cool okay now to wrap this one up we're going to go over epoll out so essentially what i've got here is a uh, 16 character message that i want to write to my pipe and i've got these two functions here called fill pipe and drain pipe and these are important for one specific reason because in linux the pipe capacity is 65536 bytes. And so essentially these fill pipe thing here, I'm going to be writing this 16 character message 4096 times, which should fill the pipe and drain pipe. I'm just going to read that 4096 times to drain the pipe. Now, uh, if you think about what we're going to be doing here, we're going to be waiting for that pipe to become available to write. So if we're doing the exact same thing here, except I fill every pipe that I create but I drain every second pipe. So if we compile this and we run it, you'll notice that the exact same thing as epoll in, except this time I'm draining the pipes instead. So the pipes are where this is an even one. So, um, you know, file descriptor five right here because it's the second one in the pair. Of course, I had to swap it over from putting uh, the read end to the right end. Uh, and file descriptor nine, which is this one here on, on this one as well. And you can do the exact same thing with epoll ctl delete. So I'll just go ahead and delete one from the thing. And as you can see, I don't care about that anymore. So that was a general overview of epoll and how you can use it in your own applications to make them scalable. I hope it was helpful for you. Cheers.